Lord is fighting against a terrible and unscrupulous enemy for the control of men's minds. The world is the announced arena. The battle will be fought here and finished here. Love and sin compete for lasting supremacy. Christ is the hero. The devil is the villain. And the universe is the audience. And though men seem stupefied and insensible, oblivious to what's going on about them, concerned angels and beings on unfallen worlds move with excitement. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, we are made a spectacle unto men and unto angels. Generations come and go. Men walk onto the stage and play some role, minor or great. Centuries grow into millenniums. Countless millions have chosen sides and have passed on in the conflict. But the show goes on, and someday soon it must end. But before it does, every morally responsible man, woman, boy, and girl in the world will have to decide where he stands in the conflict. The issues are clear. The stakes are high. There is no neutral ground. The Bible tells us, he that is not with me is against me. There is no spiritual Switzerland, no place where one can stand aside and watch the conflict rage. He is on one side or the other at all times. And I want to say to you young people tonight that if tonight or ever you have claimed to be on the side of Christ, then you have become by that profession the target of the devil's insidious, merciless attacks. He despises you with a passion which cannot be described. He hates you with all that is in him from a thousand points in a thousand ways. He comes at you, and his purpose is to destroy, to ruin, and to debauch. You need a shelter tonight. There is only one demon tamer in the universe, and that is our splendid Christ. Now, we are told something of how the devil launches his attack. Ellen White says that his first attack is against your morals. He wants to get you to commit sin, to do something wrong. He wants you to shame yourself. He wants you to uh, lose your respect and for others and for the truth. He wants to destroy your integrity and break down your morality. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 457, we read that the devil lays a snare for every soul. That means that every one of us in here, every one of us in here has been figured on, and he has laid a trap, a snare for every one of us. But the Lord speaks to us in encouragement and says, I was tempted in all points as you are, yet without sin. And the Bible says, There hath no sin taken you, but such as is common to man. That means if you are having the problem, somebody else has already had it. Had it. As a matter of fact, many people have already had it. It's common to man. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also provide a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. I thank God for that, and I believe that with all my heart. If we want to escape, there is a way made by God. The problem is we sin because we like to. Folks like to make excuses for sin. Sometimes they blame it on their friends. They blame it on their associates, on their roommates, you know, or, or something like that. The problem is we do wrong because we are unregenerate. We do wrong because we enjoy doing wrong. God makes a way out of every temptation. But the truth is, most of us crawl away from temptation, hoping it'll catch up with us. The devil's first attack, then, is against our morals. He wants to make fools out of us. He wants us to humiliate the Lord by acting like animals. And if he fails this, Ellen White says he will attack our bodies. The devil is unscrupulous. It doesn't bother him how much misery and anguish he causes you. He would just love it tonight if he could get every one of us out on the highway and mangle us in some kind of accident. That's what he delights in. He'd like for the roof of this old church to fall in and kill everybody in here. Oh, hell would ring with laughter if he could get that done tonight. 
It's only by the grace of God and through the protection of holy angels that we are spared from day to day. He will attack your body, Ellen White said. That's what he did to Job. And we are told that his purpose was to try to cause Job to curse God. His purpose was to discourage Job and cause him to turn his back on the Lord. Once Ellen White got sick, and she began to, to swell. Her face swelled up, and, and, and she couldn't talk, and she was in bad shape, and there were those who thought she would die. And finally, a ring of prayer and power surrounded her, and they made a covenant that they would neither eat nor drink until God heard them, and God did. And when the relief came, Ellen White said to them, The Lord has shown me that all the devil wanted me to do was complain and murmur. Complain and murmur. That's all he wanted her to do. And she would have dishonored the Lord. The spirit of prophecy says, worry is a sin. Discouragement is a sin. And God designs that our mind should never take a low level. When you walk around with your chin dragging the ground and looking like your religion is a pain, other people look at you and decide if Seventh-day Adventist Church, if that faith treats you like that, they don't want any part of it. And we thus dishonor the Lord. We worry ourselves out of the arms of the Savior, we are told. The devil's purpose through pain and sorrow is to destroy faith and make you think that Jesus doesn't love you. But Christ said, I'm a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. Jesus lived in this world. He was acquainted with death. Death could not abide his presence. Whenever he saw a funeral cortege, he always stopped it and he always brought the dead to life again. Jesus couldn't stand that. And in an occasion when he was dying, he stopped dying long enough to soothe the heart of his own mother by committing her to the care of his beloved John, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And he says he will draw nigh to the broken heart. If the devil can't get you through an attack on your morals, through an attack on your person, then he will attack those whom you love. He will take away your loved ones. He will do anything he can do to break your heart and to enshroud you with darkness and hopelessness and through loneliness to drive a wedge between your soul and the Savior. Now there is a statement in the spirit of prophecy that I want to call to your attention. The servant of the Lord says, it is the devil's studied plan, studied plan bring you to ruin. In other words, he doesn't go about his work haphazardly. The devil studies you. He doesn't bring the same temptation to every person. He makes a study of each individual. It's as though he were taking notes. He watches you carefully. He knows what your weaknesses are, and he tempts you on those, not on your strengths. That's the way he works. That's why the Lord's servant says that if God delivers you from a terrible past, forget it and stop talking about it. If you keep on talking about all the mistakes you used to make, the devil will get the idea you're still hankering. And he'll come at you with some of your old weaknesses. That's the way he works. He studies you. He knows about you. He knows what you think and he knows how you feel. He studies to ruin you. Now, there are some points about him that I've discovered in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy I want to call to your attention. Number one, he is presumptuous. The devil believes he can get you. He doesn't care how well you're getting along this week. He believes he can get you at an unguarded moment. He believes he can get you. It's like the fellow on television advertising white owl cigars. He says, one day you're going to try one, and when you do, we got you. And that's the way the devil feels about you. One day you're going to make a mistake. And when you do, I got you. You might serve the Lord for 50 years. And on New Year's Day of the 51st year, the devil is still after you. He doesn't give up. He is presumptuous. He even thought he could get Jesus. He waited until Christ was weakened by 40 days of fasting and prayer. And then came to him with his temptation. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be changed to bread tempting Christ on a point of appetite. And Jesus, not trusting his own philosophy, not trusting his own 
power to match which with the devil, being clothed in human flesh, went back to his own sacred word and pulled from the sword of the Spirit a fresh blade and buried it to the hilt in the philosophy of the devil. It is written, Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You've got to stay close to the word and not to logic and to rationalizing and existentializing and intellectualism and all these other things that have become gods to us. Stay close to the word if you would survive temptation. Ah, the devil said, so you want to quote scripture? Uh, I'll quote some too. And believe me, the devil knows his Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Talking about this with someone today, uh, this business of believing. How I believe in believing. But it is also a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that unless we understand and put this thing in proper perspective, we're going to believe our ways to hell. And in James 2.19, the Bible says the devils also believe. If that's all you do, you've got nothing on the devil. They believe. Faith without works is dead, said James. The devil knows the Bible. Some people think, you know, certain things, certain things which they know or do or belong to, give them special pull and special priorities. It is not so. There are those who say, well, I go to, I go to church every week. The devil does too. There are some who say, you know, I, I sing in the choir. Devil got started in the choir. He doesn't care what you do. He's presumptuous. And when the Lord quoted scripture, he decided to quote or at least misquote some. So he took Christ up on the pinnacle of the temple and misquoted Psalms 91. Go ahead and jump down, he said, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you. And the Lord once again turned to the word of God and pulled out his answer. Devil can't stand the word of God. And Christ answered him, It is written, Satan. It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then Satan took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world. That's how he gets most of us. And he said, Now look here. I know why you've come down here. You've come down here to buy back or to redeem the earth which I usurped from Adam. You've come to get it back. I read it in Isaiah 53. You've come to get it, and in order to get it, you've got to be bruised and wounded. You've got to die and pay for it with the silver of your tears and the gold of your blood. If you're going to take this earth back, it's going to cost you. But I tell you what, I'll make a deal. Watch the devil's deal. I'll make a deal with you. Bow down and worship me once, and I'll give it to you free of charge. And I want to tell you he had a right to make a deal. Even Jesus called him the prince of this world. He had a right to make a deal. So he said to Christ, bow down and worship me, and I'll give it to you. You don't have to go to the cross. I'll give it to you. If you'll just worship me once, always, it's just once, he said. Just once. Drag on marijuana once. Drop acid once. That's what he says. Park in a car once. Once we do it, he'll ride our backs and make slaves out of us. Christ was tempted. But he answered quickly from the word of God, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Ladies and gentlemen, through the power of the word and the Holy Spirit which attends the word, Christ took care of the devil's temptation. And when he gave that final answer, he wrote his own death sentence in blood. He would become the target of the devil's terrible attack. And Satan would not have mercy. Satan would bruise his heel. And Christ understood it, but he preferred to go to the cross than dishonor his Lord. And you and I have got to come to the place we'd rather die than sin. Until then, we're not worthy of salvation. But I want to tell you something else. After Christ had dispatched the devil's philosophy the third time, the Bible says angels came and ministered unto him. Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Get out of my sight. When a man is willing to stand on the word of God and when a man's faith is strong in that word, you can come to the place where you order the devil away from you and the devil has to go. And angels will come and minister unto you. I tell you, life is like that. It began that way, an alternation of sunshine and shadow. The evening and the morning were the first day. 
the evening and the morning were the second day. Ellen White says that we reach these extremes in our life and we should not make great decisions at either extreme. She said when you're riding high, forces are already set in motion to bring you down. And when you're on the bottom, forces are already set in motion to bring you up. You have to watch yourself at these extremes of depression and ecstasy. You don't think most clearly then. Life is like that. First there was Satan, and then angels came and ministered unto him. The point is, the devil is presumptuous, but God is powerful, and he loves his people. And we are told in the spirit of prophecy, before he would let the devil take unfair advantage, he would empty heaven of every angel up there and send every one of them to Lincoln, Nebraska, to look after any one of you. For he would let Satan take advantage of him. Now, he's not only presumptuous, he's powerful. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, we're told he's the prince of the power of the air. And in the sixth chapter, Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your problem is not people. And sometimes we get so angry with people, we are ready to leave the church. Now, that's a stupid reaction to problems. I meet people like that everywhere. They're out of the church and you ask them why and they can always point to somebody who mistreated them. They were set-ups. The devil had them in his right pocket. When you're ultra-sensitive, you can't be saved. You ever read that? Because you're always thinking evil. There are folks like that, you know. Every time you look at them, you think you're gossiping about them. You might not be thinking about them. Thin skin. Personality problems. Let's overcome that stuff through Christ. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. If somebody spits in your face, he's not your problem. The devil is. The devil's just using him. That's why you can afford to love your enemies. And pray for them that despitefully use you. They are not your problem. The devil's your problem. He's after you. And in Desire of Ages 466, we are told... Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. That could be your roommate. If he hasn't given himself to God, he's serving the devil. There's no middle ground. And the devil will use your roommate to try to carry you to hell. You've got to be careful, folks. He'll use some of these girlfriends and boyfriends. You've got to be careful. Your enemy is not flesh and blood, but a wicked spirit. And I want to point out thirdly that he is wicked. I told you this morning he will grin and flatter and charm himself into your confidence and then will cut you down and walk away laughing at you. The Bible calls him several names. Calls him a serpent because he's cunning. Calls him a dragon because he's fierce. Calls him a lion because he is powerful. Because he is ravenous. The devil doesn't care about you or about anyone. In Great Controversy, page 588, we read that he delights in war. For it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite nations to war against one another. For he can divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. Wicked! Doesn't care how bad it is. He is the one who incites nations to war. It, in, it, it excites the worst passions of the soul. That's why he likes it. Gets our minds off those things that are really important and onto secondary things. Or as Ellen White puts it, the real issues are concealed. We call this a diversionary tactic. The devil doesn't care about you, how rough he is on you. My nephew had been brought up in the church, wanted to get into the Marine Corps and didn't tell him he was an Adventist. Well, he wasn't a good one apparently, but he had been a pretty good boy. And he went into the Marines and when I heard about it, he was already on his way to Vietnam. And when they were sending me around the world, I got a ticket to Saigon and made arrangements that the Red Cross would bring him in from the field. I wanted to talk to him about his soul. The devil knew that. And while I was en route, three communist bullets tore his head off. He was shipped home in a pine box. The devil doesn't care about you. He wasn't going to take a chance on that boy listening to me. Not on your life. The young man played trumpet for me in the Cairo, Egypt campaign. Fine young man. Thank God he's at Andrews University now. But when that six-day war broke out just shortly after I left, 
They picked him up unprepared and rushed him to the front line. He didn't even know how to shoot a gun. And then came that humiliating retreat that you read about. And that young man and one other friend had to walk all the way across the sunny peninsula in the sun and the heat without food and without drink, and they drank their own urine. And when they came home, they were almost paralyzed. Terrible. That's the way the devil is. That's the way the devil is. A young man in Washington, D.C. had been assigned as a lay pastor of a small church. He was planning a great rally to build a church, to build a small church in that small town, a monument to God's glory. His beautiful wife was pregnant and was delivering at a hospital. He went to see her and the brand new baby born that evening. And then he started home in his Volkswagen and two fellows racing, incited by the devil, ran into him head on, killing him and his three-year-old son. Less than an hour after he had left, his wife, friends returned to the room to tell her that her husband and son were dead. And Sabbath before last, I went to that church to preach in his stead. And at his funeral, a big casket there and a little casket there. That's the way he is, the fellow whose side we take when we rebel in service when we listen to God speak and harden our hearts, when an appeal is made and we won't respond, that's whose side we're on. That's our buddy. Ellen White says he experiments in the laboratory of nature. He knows how to mix hot and cold air masses to concoct fierce storms. It is he who sends the hurricane, the tornado. It is he who destroys life. He is powerful. And then he hates righteousness. He hates you. Oh, please listen to me. We're told this by inspiration. He despises God's people. Incidentally, we're told that he hates God's ministers worse than anybody on earth. Ellen White says the Adventist minister is his prime target. Prime means first. Number one, Adventist minister is his prime target and woman his prime weapon. And he hates everybody who, who makes a break with him. He despises you. And his purpose is to destroy you, to destroy you. He despises you. There is one statement that says every moment he seeks to take your life. Every moment. Did you know there are 1,440 minutes in a day? There are 43,200 minutes in a month. There are 518,400 minutes in a year. And if you're 25 years old, you've lived 12,960,000 minutes. And isn't that impressive? And every one of those minutes of your life, the devil has wanted to destroy you. But that isn't really what inspiration says. It doesn't say every minute. It says every moment. And how can you measure a moment? Someone suggested that a moment can be measured in terms of a startle reflex. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, the saints will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, that doesn't mean winking of the eye. It takes time to do that. But the twinkling of an eye is the natural involuntary blinking of the eye to lubricate the eyeball. And it happens so fast it doesn't even cut your vision. Someone tried to measure it and says it takes one fortieth of a millisecond for the eye to twinkle. God says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. In just a fraction of a second, it happens. And so if your life were chopped up into intervals like that, every time one of those intervals passes, the devil has you in mind and desires to put you to death. That means that every time your heart beats, it's beating grace, 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 grace. And you go to bed at night and don't even say, thank the Lord. And walk around campus as though you were in charge. Indeed, as though you were the masters of your fate and the captains of your soul. You are nothing, and I am nothing. But by the grace of God, because holy angels encamp round about us, we are alive tonight. Some of us rebellious and callous and indifferent and apathetic, but alive through grace. You owe God whether you want to thank him or not. You do and I do, for the devil despises us with unspeakable hatred. And 
And then the next point I want to make is he is deceptive. And we need to understand what deception is. If the devil offered you raw sin, nobody would be deceived. Deception is when you take evil and commingle it with good so that evil looks good. And when you don't have the energy and the concern to check for yourself, when you get your religion out of paperbacks from popular theo theologians, you are a shut up and you will be deceived. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. I was having the week of prayer at Walla Walla College, and I had an office, as I do here, and there was quite a crowd coming in. And finally, about Thursday, a young lady knocked on the door, and I said, come in, and she walked in. And she was upset. And she looked me right in the eye, and I looked at her. She had her blonde hair teased high on her head and the goop around her eyes, and her dress was so short, I had to look straight up when she sat out. And she said, Pastor, I just don't buy this stuff you're teaching. And I said, well, what's wrong with it? She said, I just don't see anything wrong with a party on Friday night. I don't see anything wrong with taking marijuana in moderation. I don't see it. I said, wait a minute. I know exactly what your problem is. And I turned to 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 and twirled my Bible around in her face and traced it as I quoted it. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the eyes of them which believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel of truth should shine unto them. I understand your problem, young lady. You are lost. It is not strange to me that you cannot see. So now that we understand your problem, let's forget about what you came in to talk about and see if we can help you with your problem. By God's grace, her attitude changed. You can't see? Don't brag about it. Pray. I can't see it. Are you bragging or complaining? You got yourself a problem when you can't see what God has said expressly. The devil deceived. The Apostle Paul says, Be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove. Let me use some synonyms. That ye may prove, that ye may see, that ye may perceive, that ye may understand clearly. In order to see, to perceive, to understand clearly, to prove, you've got to be transformed. Now he uses two words, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Two different words, you may conform to the world, but in order to serve God, you've got to be transformed. The first word means that you bend yourself to fit into a certain pattern or mold, that's conformity. But transformation means you're made over, brand new. That's what has to happen to us young people in order that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. Religion is not a list of do's and don'ts. Religion does not begin with a list of prohibitions. It begins with faith in Christ and inviting the Holy Spirit into our hearts, which brings a new birth. And then having Christ dwell in us that's where good religion begins. Now let us catch the apocalyptic scene in closing our service tonight. In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, Rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He knoweth that he hath but a short time. And a student said on this campus, I want to have fun now. I'll do right later. The devil has told that student, you've got time. But he knows of himself, he has but a short time. The devil has come down unto you. He was cast out of heaven and his angels were cast out with him. And the earth is literally crawling with superhuman, terrible spirits, demons, creatures of darkness, whose one objective and goal is to destroy you. And I want to tell you something. He's more concerned about destroying and ruining the students at Union than he is those over at Nebraska U. Now, that makes sense to me. Some of you say, but we have such problems here at Union College. Well, what do you expect? 
If I were the devil, I'd want to be a good devil. I'd want to do my job wisely and well. And if I were the devil, I would come into Lincoln and forget all these other institutions, and I'd head straight for Union. And I'd go to Reese Hall and Prescott Hall and the rest of them, and I'd set up shop. Wouldn't you? Well, of course you would, if you were the devil. His job is to ruin you. I've already told you that he listens to your conversation and fits a temptation to it. That selected messages, and I think it's the first volume, page 122. And in Testimonies to Ministers, we're told on page 188 that he looks over the minister's shoulder when he's preparing his sermon. Listen now. A man sits down and is writing out his sermon. A devil is looking over his shoulder to see what he's going to preach about. And then he takes notes and he decides, well, such and such a person in room 319 shouldn't hear this sermon. So he heads to 319 to turn that guy off. And then he decides this sermon might help the young lady from Reese Hall, so I'd better take her name. She must not hear this today. Or even if she comes, she must not pay attention, so I'll have her boyfriend sit next to her, and they'll chat all the way through the sermon, and they won't get it. That's what we are told in inspiration. He watches the minister as he makes notes and prepares his counterattack. And he travels incognito. He doesn't want you to know who he is. He wants you to think he's got horns and hoofs and a tail so that when he comes and knocks on your door and asks for a date, you won't recognize him. And in the last days, Satan will, will be characterized, at least his work will be, by great spiritistic manifestations. Spiritualism, already rampant in disadvantaged countries, is now making its assault on sophisticated intellectual America. The devil has been softening up the minds of people for a long time for the great deception. And we're just about right. He started out with television and he started out with comedy. Bewitched, my mother the car, the ghost of Mrs. Muir. And when he got everybody giggling over that, he went on to dark shadows. And he's gone on from that to overt spiritism. On the news program called First Tuesday, I saw spiritism being taught in the high schools of suburban Washington, D.C. The young people of the elite families of the city were having classes in spiritism and conducting seances at pajama parties. Jean Dixon is the protege of senators and presidents, and many of the leaders of our nation call her before voting in the Congress. And all this has been clothed with a garment of respectability. She was chairman of the Crippen crippled children's drive two years ago. Mind conditioning, the great setup. And now listen in closing. The last delusion is soon to open before us. Great controversy, great controversy, 593. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. There is that warning again that I've been trying to sound for you. Let's read one more quickly. Early writings, page 60. That time will soon come, and we shall have to keep close. Pardon me. We shall have to keep hold of the strong arm of Jehovah. For all these great signs and mighty wonders of the devil are designed to deceive God's people and to overthrow them. He's not after his own. He's after God's people. And unless we're careful, we will be vulnerable, and he will take us. For the Bible declares in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, what doctrine of a devil could come in and seduce the students at Union College? Certainly, the devil can't come in here teaching that Sunday is the Sabbath. Nobody's going to fall for that. Devil isn't going to come on this campus teaching that it's all right to drink liquor. You're not going to be seduced by that doctrine of a devil. So the devil has got to be slicker than that. He's got to be more subtle than that. And he is. So he will come on this campus saying, all you've got to do is love Jesus and forget about duty. That's a doctrine of a devil. And it's loaded. He'll come on this campus telling you that you don't have to respect leadership, that the church is old-fashioned, that the generation gap is valid, that you shouldn't listen to people who talk out of the Bible and talk straight that our religion ought to be modernized, that we ought to be more compatible with other faiths. And many will fall from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And this last gem from the spirit of prophecy, 
Mrs. White says intellectuals will be but polished instruments of the devil. The arguments will be high and lofty, but terribly wrong. I want to keep a promise that I made at Walla Walla. A young man came up there to attend the Carl Porter Institute, and after the service, he wanted to see me. And a lot of people did, so I figured ten minutes with him, yeah. But when he got to talking to me, I was so engrossed in what he had to say, I finally looked around and everybody had gone home. It was 11.30 and we were the only two in the building. The next day, I went and got him out of a meeting and put it on tape. This young man's name was Terry Buchla, a very handsome young man of about 26 years. Born and reared in Oregon, came up in our church schools, attended the family altar, went into the academy, and then, like so many other young people, decided he'd better do his thing. And he went out with his cigarettes and his movies, and then he went on to beer, and from there, he went on to stronger things, and finally he got on pills, and he was without the fold of God, Terry Buchler was. And this handsome young man, a ladies' man, gave himself over to an orgy of wrongdoing. And finally, he took up gambling. And he said he noticed that he couldn't lose. When he played a game for money, he always won. And his reputation spread around, and folk came in to play him. And he made more money gambling than he did on his job. And his job was paying him something like $13 an hour. And Terry Buchler said that on the Sabbath day, he went to this place where he gambled, a tavern. And he'd been shooting pool and winning. And then finally he and his buddy took a break and were sitting at the bar. The buddy was sitting sidewise on the seat and he had his back to the table. And a fellow whom they knew made a great shot on the pool table. And his buddy said, hey, look at that shot he made. And Terry said, yeah, I saw it. His buddy said, wait a minute, how did you see it? Your back is to it. What do you mean? There's no mirror up there. How did you see it? And he said, Pastor, it began to dawn on my realization that I could see things that I wasn't looking at. And he said, to prove it, I proceeded to call every shot that boy made for the next several shots. He said, finally, his friend jumped up and ran. He said, man, you're out to lunch. I'm going. <laughs> and he said, there I sat. I thought I was losing my mind. I was saying to myself, you see, I knew I shouldn't have gone so far. I know better, and now it's happening. My mother said it would happen one day. I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. And he said, while he was sitting there, a being materialized across the bar. I said, Terry, what did he look like? He said, it was Satan. I said, how did you know? He said, by his eyes. I said, what form did he take? Was he angelic? Did he have wings? He said, no, no. A man in a gray suit, a very handsome man at that, except for his eyes. He said, man, I can't describe those eyes. Have you ever heard that common description from spiritualists? I said, what was he doing? He said, he was sitting a little higher than I was, leaning over on his hand, looking right at me. And then he spoke, and he said, Terry, I've done a lot for you. He said, all the things you got and the way you win at pool and that good job you're holding down. He said, I did that for you. He said, now I want you to do something for me. And if you'll come all the way over on my side, you may name your price. And then he just leaned and looked into Terry's eyes. And Terry said, I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy. So he decided to look around to see if the other young people, and, and this is the part that caused the tears to drop off his face and down onto the table and he wet my hand as I held the microphone. This is what he told me to tell you. He said, Pastor, when I looked around that room at my 25 or 30 friends who were there, girls and fellas, drinking and talking and having a big time, when I looked around to see if they saw what I saw, he said, do you know every one of them had a demon standing beside him? with the same eyes as the one talking to me. And they didn't know it. He said, Pastor, tell the young people wherever you go. Tell them who's with them when they go into forbidden places. 
Tell them who's keeping their company. For angels don't go into those places. Angels don't go into discotheques and dance halls and taverns and nightclubs. Tell them when they go to the theater who is with them. Please tell them, he said. I said, Terry, I'll tell them. I said, what were those demons doing? He said, some were enjoying themselves. This is their kind of entertainment. He said, others were watching their prey very closely as though they were not sure of them. He said, so I said nothing and turned around again. And the devil said, Terry, what is your answer? He said, and then I remembered hearing somewhere that if you pray, the devil would flee. And he said, I thought to myself, if I could get off this bar stool and drop on my knees fast enough and begin to pray, the devil would get away from me. Can you imagine being in a dilemma like that, a former Seventh-day Adventist, knowing what he knew in a bar on the Sabbath, drinking beer and wanting to pray? He said with a sudden move, he pushed away from the bar and dropped down on his knees, and that's all he remembered. His friends told him that he was leaping around that place like a frog and running into the door, head and body, until he battered in his face and the blood began to run. And finally, he hit it so hard, he fell out. And he laid there for a few minutes. They told him this. And then he got up and went through that door. And he said, Pastor Brooks, when I came to my senses again, he said, I had run past my car and was down in the parking lot running through the shrubberies and up against people's cars screaming like a maniac. And he said, out there in the darkness when I came to myself, spent and worn out and bruised and bloody, I told the Lord, if you'll take me back, I'm coming. I said, Terry, how long ago did this happen? He said, three weeks. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I came up here when I heard there was a carport institute. I thought I'd sell some books. I said, what about your job for thirteen fifty an hour? He said, forget it. Nothing is worth my soul. Got a follow-up on that in closing. A woman wrote to me about an article I had put in the Review and Herald from Oregon. And I wrote back and told her about Terry. I said, Did you know, do you know him? And she wrote back and said, yes, Terry married a minister's daughter. And the two of them are now working in one of these uh, halfway houses for others who are on drugs. Terry is working for the Lord. But he told me to tell you that story. A young Caucasian boy grew up in the faith sold out to the devil, and almost lost his soul. His words were, I was standing on the brink of hell. One step, and I was gone. That's the kind of enemy we're up against. But there is one who is almighty, who loves you, who cares about you, who can protect you, and who's been doing it. It makes sense to stand on his side. But when you do, you're on a winning team. I commit myself. That's my team. How about you? You young folks really want me to pray for you tonight. Are you kidding or did you just go through the motions? Are you for real? You'd better think. Are you for real? If you are, won't you stand up again? Bow your heads, close your eyes, right now. Lord, there are demons abroad in the land. They're after us. We are no match for them, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our only hope is in Jesus. We're standing tonight, Lord, and everyone standing has already testified by his standing that he means business. We're for real. Look at them, Lord, in the balcony and in the side rooms. We're standing. We don't want the devil to get us. We need help, therefore. We come to thee knowing that you're able to keep us. You've told us in your word through Ellen White that we should go to bed at night with every sin confessed. And some of us are not praying. 
We're crawling into beds and dropping into unconscious sleep with our pages stained in glory. And if Satan could just kill us, he's got us. He's got us. Give us better sense than that. Let this week of prayer move us, Godward, forever. Hear us, Lord. For without thee, we are an easy prey. If somebody is standing just because others stay, stood, if somebody is standing with a calloused heart, if somebody is standing who is indifferent, I pray especially for that soul, for special mercy, special grace, special power, and special probation. Thank you for hearing us. We feel better when we talk to you. And we come only in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight, dear ones, before we go, I wish you would just turn to the person close to you and then kneel down and the two of you pray together audibly. The room will sound like a room full of confusion, but God has to hear thousands of prayers at the same time anyhow. So what difference does it make? Just choose one partner and the two of you pray, and when you finish, we'll be ready to go home. Let's do it now.